The Bengal Swamp is a vast and brackish swampland that was created through continental collisions, 100 million AD. The continents have drifted vast distances since the Quaternary. A massive rift of land which broke away from Africa along the East African Rift has moved across what was the Indian Ocean and collided with the southernmost corner of Southeast Asia. As the two landmasses came together, a vast inland sea was created between in the area that was once the Bay of Bengal. The massive forces created by the colliding tectonic plates buckled the landmass, giving rise to a volcanic mountain range along the line of fusion. Over time, the inland sea became almost entirely cut off from the oceans to the south. Water runoff from the mountains formed rivers which washed fertile sediment into the landlocked sea. Eroded material from the newly exposed rocks was carried downwards, filling the basin and making it shallower and rich in nutrients. Gradually, the inland sea diminished, freshwater from the mountains mixed with the residual saltwater, and a vast, brackish swamp was formed. 100 million AD. The Bengal Swamp covers hundreds of thousands of square miles. Sediment carried by slow-moving channels and meandering rivers makes the water thick and impenetrable to light. Sedimentary deposits have a series of oxbow lakes and backwaters separated by muddy islands and flats. The Bengal Swamp is comparable in appearance to the Great Lowland Coal Swamps of the Carboniferous Period. The climate of the Bengal Swamp is hot. Its proximity to the equator and the shelter provided by the surrounding mountains mean that average temperatures are about over 40 degrees Celsius. Water is plentiful, running down from the mountains in an intricate network of rivers. Humidity is extremely high, averaging 99% all year round. The muds and soils are constantly replenished by nutrient-rich volcanic ash. A greenhouse environment like this is an ideal place for vegetation to grow. Plant life chokes the waterways and spreads across the lakes. Thickets of tropical plants clothe the sandbanks and deltas. Tightly spaced trees stand where any land is solid enough to hold them, spreading deep canopies of branches and leaves overhead and stabilizing the mud with their network of roots. A host of dangerous creatures dwell in the murky backwat. Urs and shallows of the Bengal Swamp beneath the tangle of thick choking vegetation. The Bengal Swamp has become so dangerous so full of large swimming predators that some other water creatures have taken refuge out of the water indeed the atmosphere of this hot swamp is so humid that many aquatic animals can spend time on land and not suffer any discomfort. In an environment such as the Bengal Swamp where vegetation flourishes the presence of large herbivores is no surprise. Once a lurk fish has struck the surrounding area of swamp seems to come to life the disturbance in the water splashing noises and electrical signals all send out the message that danger has passed the lurk fish has hunted successfully. The lurk fish is a species of large predatory fish native to the rivers and lakes of the Bengal swamp of 100 million ADA descendant of the electric catfish it is notable for its ability to produce a strong electric shock with which it stuns or kills its prey. The lurk fish is a very large fish at 4 meters long its scaly skin and weed-like fins spine sand barbels effectively camouflage it as a large log making it difficult to see in the murky water of the swamp it has a male of thick protective plates covering its body beneath the skin shielding its internal organs however its fins and barbels are still vulnerable to attack the lurk fish's pectoral fins carry muscular spines that bury into the mudaloing it to dig itself in. As its name implies the lurkfish's ancestor on electric catfish could also stun its prey with an electrical charge. Along each side of the lurkfish are stacks of electrical muscles blocks called electrocytes these electrocytes are able to generate a small charge individually but when used at once they can generate a cumulative charge of over 1000 volts the barbels of the lurkfish are also sensitive to any movement in the water they form an electrical sensory net capable of detecting even the smallest movement of potential prey in the water nearby. The lurk fish is an ambush predator which can remain motionless in the water for several days without eating. E may equals 0.4 s, greater than it will wait for some time until prey moves within striking range before launching itself forwards and engulfing its victim in its enormous mouth it then retreats into the thick muddy water deeper in the swamp to eat in safety. Larger more dangerous prey items which could do injury to the lurk fish such as the venomous swampasare paralyzed or outright killed by the lurk fish's electric charge before they get too close. 
The lurkfish hunts a large number of aquatic swamp animals but one of its most substantial prey items is the swampusan amphibious octopus swampuses must return to the water to replenish their oxygen and to travel exposing themselves to attack from the lurkfish which is not affected by the swampuses venomous bite due to its long-range killing method. The atmosphere of this hot swamp is so humid that many aquatic animals can spend time on land and not suffer any discomfort one creature to have taken advantage of the relative safety of land is the swampus. The swampus or swampus octopus is a species of amphibious octopus native to the Bengal swamp of 100 million AD. Octopuses were already capable of performing basic tasks out of water such as hauling themselves onto dry land when the world warmed up followed the ice age which dominated 5 million AD. Species such as octopuses exploited the opportunities presented by a hothouse world habitats that were once restricted due to the colder climates were now open for cephalopods to explore. Now 100 million years hence the humid conditions of the Bengal swamp have allowed species such as the swampus to take refuge out of the water without suffering discomfort. The swampus has evolved to survive on land though for limited periods of time unable to breathe properly out of water it relies on finite oxygen stores in its tissues and blood once these reserves have been depleted the swampus must return to the water to replenish its oxygen supply. To further cope with the maneuverability challenges present in an amphibious lifestyle the swampus has evolved rudder-like paddles to help maneuver and support itself outside of swamp water. The humid conditions of the Bengal swamp have allowed creatures to take refuge out of water one of the advantage of transitioning to an amphibious lifestyle is raising young. Reek time equals 0.4 s greater than living in a more controlled environment allows swampus mothers to regularly monitor and provide food and amp shelter for their young inside open plants created by seasonal floods. Conquests over stretches of land are common, although they are determined by intimidation as the swampus would avoid risk of injury in such disputes. The advantages provided in a controlled environment allow swampus mothers to provide food shelter and protection for their young inside open plants known as nursery vasi seasonal floods have created open pools inside these plants an ideal environment for the swampus to raise their young swampus larvae will first acquire their lethal bite from the toxins located inside the plant once the swampus's oxygen stores become depleted it must resurface, leaving it vulnerable to predation although swampuses are protective parents even in groups adults offer little protection from the carelessness of adult toration kicking down anything in their paths. Reptiles are doing well due to the warm condition sand this tortoise descendant is the largest animal to have ever walked on earth equally at home on dry land or wading through the swamp they spend the day browsing for food as they have to consume huge amounts of vegetation. The toradon is a species of enormous tortoise native to the Bengal swamp and its surrounding grasslands in 100 million AD 7 meters tall and tipping the scales at 120 tons the toradon is among the largest terrestrial animals in history and certainly the largest animal since the age of the dinosaurs. The toradon have descended from today's tortoises the lush vegetation in the Bengal swamp provides the tortoises with many nutrients and sources of energy to properly and fully ferment and absorb the nutrients found in these food sources tortoises evolved much larger stomachs larger stomachs allowed the tortoises to evolve much larger body mass to support its enormous proportions the toradon's legs are directly underneath the animal itself as opposed to being to its sides over a course of millions of years the toradon's shell has gradually segmented given its massive Zeth toradon has no need for a shell. The toradon resembles its human era counterpart to some extent. Twos, greater than though with many prominent evolutionary changes, the toradon is significantly larger than modern tortoises and perhaps even larger than most sauropod dinosaurs. To support its immense size the toradon's legs are directly underneath the animal itself rather than to it its sides like crocodiles and lizards. As adults have no natural predators due to their size, the toradon's shell has now become segmented allowing to animal to more easily browse for food. Having such a large shell would only succeed in restricting the tortoise's mobility. The toradons are often described and portrayed as enormous eating machines, of which spend the majority of the lives, browsing and consuming huge amounts of rich vegetation. The toradons have established and travel in large herds similar to that of elephants, carelessly knocking over any objects in their path. Toratons are generally gentle giants, though they can be angered when their young are killed. While no animal is capable of bringing down an adult toradon, 
young Toratans may find themselves inflicted and eventually suffocated by the lethal bite of a protective swampus mother, and are vulnerable to predation by predators. When traveling in herds, adult Toratans will carelessly kick over whatever objects are blocking their paths, which potentially includes swampus nurseries. During the 100 million AD mass extinction, the skies are blotted out by clouds of ash, lowering temperatures, and much of the vegetation of the Bengal swamp was incinerated by white-hot ash. The cold-blooded Toratans could not survive in these conditions, they stood motionless, their vitality seeping away in the cold. The Shallow Seas is a vast warm shallow seaway in 100 million AD. 100 million a warm global climate has caused the polar ice caps to melt sea levels to rise by around 100 meters lower lying parts of the continents are flooded and the oceans have spread southwards from the Arctic and eastwards from the Atlantic vast tracts of Russia are now almost entirely underwater the shallow seas which stretch across northern Europe and ASI are punctuated by rocky islands. The sun-filled nutrient-rich waters of the shallow seas provide ideal conditions for the formation of reefs. Reefs are essentially calcium deposits built up by generations of reef-building marine organisms. These organisms contract calcium dissolved in seawater and use it to lay down protective shells over successive generations. The shells and skeletons of the reef-building organisms accumulate to create a great edifice, a solid foundation upon which reef builders live and photosynthesize. This edifice is a reef. The shallow seas and their colorful complex reefs have presented a stable environment for a long time they have persisted for so many millions of years that effective living systems established early on in the history of the habitat have been able to survive without serious challenges as a result creatures body shapes feeding methods and symbiotic relationships have modified only slightly over time however these warm seas have allowed one thing to change a lotand that is a creature's size. With the recent glacial period in 5 million AD came massive climatic disruption the seas filled with mud depriving the algae of the sunlight they needed for survival without the algae and the essential nutrients they provided the corals also became extinct some time later mountains of millions of years later there are large areas of warm shallow water and conditions are right for reefs to develop once more this Timoth reefs are formed not from coral but from a prolific species of red algae. A variety of red algae is native to the shallow seas it is the most populous organism of these seas. Greater than where it has replaced corals in creating reefs, and as an important food or energy source for both reef gliders and ocean phantoms. The ocean phantom conceals a secret weapon inside specially adapted tentacles, in return for food and shelter, an army of vicious spindle troopers is on hand to defend the phantom from other predators. The spindle trooper is a species of highly specialized sea spider native to the shallow seas of 100 million AD. It has a symbiotic relationship with the ocean phantoms, which provide small armies of spindle troopers with shelter and food in exchange for defense. Spindle troopers have evolved to live side by side with ocean phantoms. A single phantom can have as many as 12 or so spindle troopers living among the tentacles, some of which have morphed into capsules similar in shape to bladderwort plants. The spindle troopers use as houses. Despite being arachnids, spindle troopers are vegetarians and feed on the red algae growing on the phantom's back. In return spindle troopers loyally protect the phantom from predators, such as reef gliders, the spindle troopers will leap at the attacker and begin biting it repeatedly until said attacker backs off, whereas the spindle troopers will swim back to the phantom. It is unknown if spindle troopers have predators of their own. The large form of a reef glider can often be seen sweeping through the water, silhouetted against the bright surface and throwing its shadow across a red alga reef. From its bulbous, teardrop-shaped body protrude three pairs of paddles, a long bunch of streamer-like filaments trails behind. It is difficult to believe that this is a variety of nudibranch, bigger than any of its relatives. The reef glider is a species of giant free-swimming nudibranch or sea slug found in the shallow seas of 100 million AD. Growing up to 4 meters in length, reef gliders are the largest known gastropods in history. They are highly successful, and by the 100 million AD mass extinction, in which they vanished, they had already existed in their final form for millions of years. The reef glider has descended from today's nudibranchs. Following the ice age of 5 million AD, the waning of the ice caps, gradual warming of the world's oceans and extinction of coral reefs, the sea slugs abandoned crawling in order to meet th. 
E-challenge is presented by a warmer, more open environment. The nudie branch became oval-shaped, developing paddles, flesh extensions extending from its sides and gills now trailing behind in a colorful display. Fully grown reef gliders can grow up to 4 meters, oval-shaped and somewhat bloated, though less vibrant than its human-era counterpart. The reef glider sports eyes mounted on stocks, a cone-shaped, beak-like mouth and a display of bumpy, scent-detecting chemical receptors, called rhinophores. As opposed to crawling across reefs by expanding and contracting its body, the reef glider has developed paddles, flesh extensions extending from its sides, each pair beats in turn propelling the animal across the shallow seas. While the adults are predators, young reef gliders derive most of their nutrients from red algae, feeding from the cup-like structures formed by the algae, where deposits of protein and carbohydrate are stored. Symbiotically, they also help the algae to reproduce. When the gliders reach their mouths into the algae's cups, their beaks become coated with sticky strands of reproductive gamete cells, which are then scraped off inside another algae's cup when the glider feeds again. The algae may be specially adapted to be pollinated specifically by reef gliders, as their flowers are precisely the right size and shape for a juvenile reef glider's front end. Young reef gliders themselves are hunted by ocean phantoms, giant colonial siphonophore, which catch them using their tentacles when the young gliders are gyrating among the red algae. Sometimes a baby reef glider will even approach an ocean phantom willingly, out of curiosity. The adult reef gliders, however, are too large to be harmed by ocean phantoms, and are in fact its chief predators. Adult gliders hunt ocean phantoms in packs, devouring their air sacs, tentacles, rudders, and keels, every part of the phantom beneath the waterline. Phantoms, however, also have a defense in the form of spindle troopers. Something large and sinister glides slowly overhead. It casts a long shadow which creeps across the irregular surface of the reef. This is not the shadow of an adult reef glider. But something much slower, much bigger and much more dangerous. The ocean phantom is a marine siphonophore native to the shallow seas covering central and northern Asia 100 million AD. It is a giant type of siphonophore, a colonial organism composed of several individuals which serve different roles, and can grow up to 30 feet long and be composed of several thousand polyps, making it the largest marine animal of 100 million AD. The ocean phantom's human-era ancestor is the Portuguese man o war the ocean phantom is a jack-of-all-trades creatures, it can propel itself by puffing out many dorsal fins and use them as sails, but can also use jet propulsion like cephalopods. The phantom's back is often covered in red-colored algae, which the phantom gives to the spindle troopers living among the tentacles. Beneath the phantom are trawling tentacles, some act as harpoons for catching prey while others become homes for the spindle troopers. Like their ancestors the phantom is capable of stinging. Ocean phantoms are nomadic by nature, traveling vast distances wherever the wind takes them. Small reef gliders are the primary prey of the phantom, but they themselves are hunted by bigger reef gliders. Fortunately the phantom has formed a relationship with the arthropod the spindle trooper, often having a personal army who loyally defend their host from attack, and in return the phantom feeds them the algae growing on its back. When volcanic eruptions blot out the sky in the 100 million AD mass extinction, the oceans of the world are hit particularly hard, as the microorganisms which the whole ecosystems rely upon die off quickly. The water temperature falls and the prevailing currents fail, the ocean phantoms deflate and die, and soon go extinct. The ocean phantom is a controversial topic mainly due to its complex nature and mutualism established with other organisms. Arguments include the siphonophore is too hypothetical. The reef glider has faced mild controversy. Primary arguments have targeted the nudie branch's large proportions presented in the future as wild. This rainforest has evolved from whatever plant species made it to the isolated continent first. Similarly, the animals there have radiated to fill all the available niches have evolved from relatively few ancestors, as reaching this virgin continent was so difficult. The Antarctic Forest or Antarctic Rainforest is a large tropical rainforest in the north of the continent of Antarctica in 100 million AD. By this era, 
Antarctica has drifted far north enough for it to lie partially in the tropics, and the Antarctic forest is a lush place flourishing with unique plant and animal life, particularly those that have mastered flight such as birds and insects. The Antarctic plate has been moving northwards for 100 million years, gradually creeping towards the southern edge of Asia. This plate has carried the continent out of the polar zone, through the southern temperate zone and across the southern desert belt. The forest covers almost the entirety of Antarctica's northern region, including several mountainous areas. The south of the continent still lies in colder climes, so the forest has not spread far south. The Antarctic forest lies in the tropics, not too far south of the equator, and is therefore very warm, especially given 100 million AD's generally higher global temperatures. Trade winds also bring year-round warm rains, giving a further boost to plant life. The first vertebrate settlers were birds, their powers of flight enabling them to cross the oceans to reach the isolated continent, and they brought with them yet more seeds and insects. As Antarctica is an island continent, separated from the rest of the world by hundreds of miles of sea, all life in the Antarctic forest has flown or been blown there. While the continent lays in the polar regions, its plant life consisted mainly of mosses, lichens, and alga. However, as it drifted north, seeds and spores of true plants were blown west from South America, and those seeds which survived established themselves in Antarctica and radiated into several different species, eventually giving rise to the Antarctic forest itself. More plants were brought over with successive animal migrations, and the Antarctic forest is home to a great variety of plant life including the Spitfire tree a keystone species on which several animals rely. The first foreign animals to arrive on the continent were spiders and insects which were lightweight enough to be carried there on the winds they flourished among the developing plant life and eventually evolved into larger forms due to high global oxygen levels. Insects are the dominant predators of the Antarctic forest with giant wasps chasing down other animals and predatory beetles ambushing them. Birds specifically tubnose seabirds like petrels shearwaters fulmars and albatrossashad inhabited the coasts of Antarctica even when it was covered in ice and with the development of the forest they evolved into myriad forms the most common birds are the flutterbirds which come in a variety of shapes and forms but there are other bird families including ones which have become ground dwellers the forest is also home to other non tubnose birds which arrived from across the seas. The Spitfire tree is a species of flowering tree native to the Antarctic forest of 100 million at it as a keystone species of the forest's ecosystem. The male and female flowers of the Spitfire tree produce different chemicals which become volatile when mixed together the Spitfire bird drinks these chemicals and mixes them in its crop using them as a powerful chemical weapon against predators such as falconflies Spitfire birds also help to pollinate the trees as they pick up and drop seeds when they dip their beaks into the flowers. The Spitfire bird's reliance on the trees is exploited by Spitfire beetles which are able to disguise themselves as Spitfire blossoms and then kill the birds when they come in to feed fall Spitfire birds also stay around Spitfire trees in order to mimic true Spitfire birds and so warn off predators. With a squawk and a flurry of feathers to two tumble through the branches and undergrowth and crash to the ground there the falconfly rips the victim to pieces with its powerful jaws. The falconfly is a species of giant predatory wasp native to the Antarctic forest of 100 million AD. Greater than it is the top predator of the forest and preys on birds including flutterbirds. The falconfly is the size of a human-era bird of prey such as a kestreland has a very powerful set of jaws its forelimbs have small hooks which allow it to grab prey whilst its hind limbs have very sharp plants like tips which can be used to impale or stab prey like other wasps it also has a venomous sting. Falconflies are aerial predators which seize their prey with their hooked legs and either use their hind legs like a lance or a harpoon to stab deep into the prey's internal organs or give the prey a jab with their sting the falconfly will tackle the prey down onto the forest floor and tear it to pieces using its jaws. Falconflies give birth to three to four maggots which are each laid in a separate burrow to prevent them from cannibalizing one another a mother falconfly will take care of her maggots returning to her burrows to feed her young with lumps of flesh from butchered prey she remembers where each burrow is by memorizing familiar landmarks. 
Falconflies prey on flying birds such as flutterbirds most notably the defenseless roachcutter not all flutterbirds are so defenseless however, the spitfire bird is capable of spitting hot acid at attackers driving them off another species of flutterbird the false spitfire birdies itself harmless but it mimics the appearance of the true spitfire bird to warn off predators including falconflies even so the falconfly can overpower the spitfire bird if the bird has run out of ammo and is attempting to restock sometimes stealing from spitfire beetles. Motionless the Spitfire beetles wait mimicking the flowers of the Spitfire tree as it moves in the beetles leap into action seizing the bird before it can bring its defenses into play grasshopper like hind legs propel the attack and strong jaws and grappling hooked claws on the forelegs crunch into the bird's body. The Spitfire beetle is a species of social predatory beetle native to the Antarctic forest of 100 million AD notable for their ability to closely mimic the appearance of a Spitfire tree blossom in order to ambush prey. Spitfire beetles resemble a typical beetle of the human era. K time equals 0.2 s, greater than and, individually, are notable only for their bright red and yellow coloration. Their hind legs are similar to those of grasshoppers, allowing them to propel themselves forwards, and their forelegs have grappling hook-like claws. Several parts of their body help them to resemble Spitfire blossoms, their coloration, their stamen-like antennae, their petal-like elytra, and their heads and thoraxes, which when put together resemble the center of a flower. Spitfire beetles spend most of their lives in sibling groups of four. They are carnivorous ambush predators, and, to hunt, they mimic the appearance of a Spitfire tree blossom. The four beetles position themselves on a Spitfire trunk, standing head to head in a cross formation, then spread their wings, revealing the highly camouflaged parts of their bodies. The beetles will wait until a Spitfire bird approaches the flower, then leap at it using their grasshopper-like legs, seizing it and killing it with their strong jaws and hooked claws. All four beetles will then share the carcass of the bird. When the Spitfire tree's flowering season ends and Spitfire birds no longer approach the trees, the beetle colonies disperse, moving off in search of mates. Once mated, the male beetle dies, and the pregnant female lays clutches of four eggs beneath the bark of Spitfire trees. The female beetle also dies soon afterwards, and the eggs hatch the following spring, when the Spitfire tree's flowering season has begun again. The Spitfire beetle is one of a large community of organisms which relies on the Spitfire tree, as noted above. Not only is it specifically adapted to hunt Spitfire birds by imitating the flower of the tree, it also lays its eggs beneath its bark. Because Spitfire birds get their acidic chemicals from the Spitfire tree flowers, the beetles don't have to worry about getting sprayed, since a Spitfire bird will only move in to feed from a flower when its store of chemicals is depleted. On a few occasions the beetles get robbed of their prey by falconflies. The roachcutter uses its keen eyesight to spot prey. Its wings are short and broad, giving it great maneuverability in the dense forest. The roa. Shkatur is a species of flutterbird native to the Antarctic forest of 100 million at it as a specialized insect hunter and as the swiftest of the flutterbirds. The roachkutter is a small flutterbird about the size of a sparrow and can be distinguished from other flutterbirds by its purple feathers which turn to cream on its head and iridescent blue on its wingtips and by its eyes which are mounted on turrets its beak is also very strong and capable of crushing hard exoskeletons. Its short wings have a high aspect ratio, they are short and broad, which makes them perfect for making tight turns in mid-air and their tips are splayed out like fingers allowing them to manipulate the passage of air increasing the roachcutter's maneuverability Thucyd is able to both slowly navigate tight space and fly at very high speeds. The roachcutter is a specialized predator of insects scanning tree trunks for small insects using its turreted eyes however it is itself hunted by an insect. The falconfly a giant wasp roachcutters have no defense against falcon flies which have hooked foreleg sharpoon like hind legs powerful jaws and venomous stings. It dips its head repeatedly into the flower from which it appears to be feeding suddenly there may be a hum and flutter as the other residents of the forest canopy flee an approaching predator but rather than darting away to safety this bird faces the danger as the predator draws near the spitfire bird will lower its head then at the last possible moment it sprays a hot corrosive acid from its nostrils. 
The Spitfire bird is a species of flutterbird native to the Antarctic forest of 100 million AD using chemicals gathered from the Spitfire tree it is capable of shooting a nasty acid-like chemical substance at potential predators they may appear cute but when they attack you will be running. Spitfire birds are perhaps the most dangerous birds in the Antarctic jungle due to their secret weapon they also have bright colors to warn predators of said secret weapon something that another flutterbird exploits, the false Spitfire bird. K time equals 0.4 s greater than Spitfire birds behave rather like hummingbirds, aside from feeding on flowers they can also hover. The falcon fly is one of its predators, though when hit by the bird's chemicals they'll give them a wide berth, but if the Spitfire bird has run out of chemicals then the falcon fly can subdue it. The bird's main predator though is the Spitfire beetle, who exploit the birds need to replenish their chemicals by mimicking the flowers, four beetles will clump together, pose as a flower and when a bird approaches they pounce and kill it. The false Spitfire bird is a species of flutterbird native to the Antarctic forest of 100 million AD. It is a docile cousin of the Spitfire bird, and mimics its appearance as a form of defense against predators. Due to the Spitfire bird's notoriety for shooting burning chemicals at predators, falconflies that had run ins will avoid preying on this species as well. It is unknown if the false Spitfire bird has the same dietary preferences or is hunted by Spitfire beetles. The Great Plateau is a very high, mountainous plateau in 100 million AD. Since the Cretaceous period to the Eocene epoch of the Paleogene period, Australia became separated from Antarctica, slowly moving north across the Pacific Ocean towards Asia. Where the two continental plates met, one was pushed below the other, creating a subduction zone to the southeast of the Asian landmass, as the ocean lithosphere, the rigid outer layer of Earth, was drawn down into the mantle and melted, new magma was produced, resulting in large amounts of volcanic activity. Now, in 100 million AD, Australia's short life as a single continent is over, and it has finally fused with the southeastern edge of Asia and later the northeastern edge. Seafloor sediments and rock between the two landmasses have been compressed, sheared, ground together and thrust up into a massive mountain chain. This new chain exceeds the proportions of the Himalayas, the highest mountain range of the Quaternary. Like the Himalayas in their time, these new mountains continue to rise. As the tectonic plates crush against one another, they simultaneously compress the rock downwards into Earth's mantle and upwards into the sky. Further compression has raised a large block of Southeast Asia to form the Great Plateau, the broadest tract of uplands on the surface of the planet. This immense plateau, surrounded by mountains, towers over the shallow shelf seas which cover much of the landmass. Newly formed mountains are sharp and jagged. It takes time for the constant assault of rain, wind, frost and running water to erode them into rounded shapes. In 100 million AD, the Himalayas are mere hills, undulation in the center of the continent. The Great Plateau, on the other hand, consists of ranges of pointed pinnacles and knife-edged crests dropping away into slopes of fragmented rock and scree. The valleys and basins between the ridges have filled with newly eroded debris and formed upland plains, surrounded by peaks reaching up to 10,000 meters, higher than any mountains of the past. How will life survive at this altitude? The climate of the weather-beaten peaks of the Great Plateau will certainly be harsh, but Earth during 100 million AD is warm and volcanic. A sea activity has thrown large amounts of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere, making survival easier. There are ample resources for life to flourish. The Great Plateau, this system of high plains and basins, hemmed in by the highest mountains in the world, is not the dry, cold desert one might expect. Back during the reign of humanity, high-altitude mountain systems such as the Himalayas were home to little more than hardy desert herbs, shrubs and small rodents. Not so the valleys and plains of the Great Plateau, 100 million years on. These are rolling grasslands. At the outer edges of the Great Plateau, the steep, Debris-covered slopes are swept by winds bringing seasonal rains up from the shallow seas. The heavy rainfall and loose soil make for an unstable surface, prone to mudslides and rock falls. 
However, in many areas the surface is stabilized by plant life evolved to cope with just such conditions. The oceanward slope of the Great Plateau is green with true grasses. Ridges and banks of vegetation undulate down into the layer of cloud drifting up from the sea. Beyond a narrow coastal plain, sunlight glints on the crest of the waves. Earthquakes are common, as the plateau is still being pushed up, and it is on the center of the the meeting point of multiple tectonic plates. Grass trees are grasses which have resilient, woody stems. In the human era only bamboo generated such stems, but in 100 million AD there are many different species of grass trees native to the Great Plateau. Grass trees are keystone species on the Great Plateau. Their complex underground stems stabilize the loose muddy ground, preventing landslides and making it safe to traverse. Their seeds are harvested by silver spiders, caught in their webs which are spun across the canyons, and are fed to the poggles which the spiders farm. The grass trees of the Great Plateau are wiped out in the 100 million AD mass extinction, leading to the collapse of the ecosystem as animals are deprived of the seasonal influx of grass seeds. The poggles are not just tolerated, they are actively encouraged. The carnivorous silver spiders are farmers of a different kind, the Grain harvest is there to feed up the livestock before it is butchered. The poggle is a species of rodent native to the Great Plateau of 100 million AD. It is among the last of the mammals. Poggles are at home in the many caverns honeycombing the plateau, usually sharing their caves with a colony of silver spiders. Large black beady eyes give the poggle good vision, a necessary tool for living in mostly dark caves, though like their ancestors they can grab with their forepaws. A herbivore, poggles mainly, if not exclusively feed on the seeds of grass trees. Poggles are low in the food chain, having been turned into livestock by the silver spiders, who feed them the grass tree seeds to fatten the poggles up, and when this is accomplished one spider takes the poggle prisoner and presents it to the queen, who then kills it. Female poggles in estrus in particular are specifically eaten by the queen spiders to help them reproduce. It is unknown if poggles leave their caves or face predation from other animals. Just as some species of spiders in previous times spun webs with an ultraviolet sheen in order to attract insects, so too do the spiders of this time. Spread across the slopes of the Great Plateau, giant silver webs billow gently in the wind. The silver spider is a species of colonial spider native to the Great Plateau of 100 million AD. The silver spider, judging by the structure and body shape has likely descended from the redback spider or a similar species, when Australia completed its continental course, colliding with Asia and North America the spiders over millions of years, adapted numerous behavioral traits similar of that of the order Hymenoptera being ruled by a queen with the majority of all spiders spending their lives as workers. This behavioral system advanced further following the relationship established between the spiders and the poggles, a shy rodent of which the spiders farm as livestock. The silver spider behaves rather like Hymenoptera, being ruled by a queen with the majority being workers. Their shiny appearances are due to the colors being meant to reflect ultraviolet radiation in their high-altitude home. Their webs are the largest in the world, to build. The smallest and youngest workers parasail from one side of a gorge to the other with a dandelion and a silk thread. Once this is completed, a bye. GGER worker comes over adds another line and walks out onto the thread in a few hours they will complete the web which looks as though it is made up of smaller webs sewn together like their ancestors they do possess venomous fangs. The silver spider have established a behavioral system similar to that of Hymenoptera, being ruled by a queen with the majority being workers the workers will spend the majority of their lives constructing webs in between cave systems and collecting grass tree seeds for the piggies to consume when the toggle reaches ideal weight the plump rodent is slain and devoured by the spider queen, allowing her to access the hormones from the poggle's bloodstream of which she acquires. Silver spiders have formed a relationship with the poggle, a rodent and one of the few mammals still alive sadly the poggles have been turned into livestock by the spiders who feed them seeds from grass trees caught in the webs fatten them up and when this is done the now plump poggle is slain and devoured silver spiders themselves are food for the great blue windrunner though it's possible the spiders feed on them too, the windrunner is small enough to be caught in the webs though aside from the poggle it is unknown for certain what else the spider eats. 
the Great Blue Windrunner can soar at high altitudes making use of its long narrow wings at low speeds the bird requires greater maneuverability and so deploys an additional pair of wings from its legs for extra surface area and uplift. The Great Blue Windrunner is a large species of gruiform bird native to the lowland regions south of the Great Plateau of 100 million Ada descendant of the cranes it is notable for having a second pair of wings in its hind legs. The Windrunner is a descendant of human-era cranes when Australia completed its continental drift, colliding with Asia and North America much of the crane's habitat was replaced by an enormous mountainous range the crane abandoned its wetland marshes and rivers in favor of a migratory lifestyle. The crane has developed long narrow wings as having a large wingspan allows the Windrunner to cover larger distances to increase its maneuverability and further aid its landing when descending on mountainous peaks the Windrunner evolved wing feathers down on its legs. Time equals 0.2 s, greater than this not only allows the bird to cover larger distances but allows for a smoother landing. Soaring at such a great altitude leaves the windrunner vulnerable to harmful ultraviolet rays, which led to the evolution of the windrunner's blue plumage, which repels the sun's harmful UV rays. The windrunner is a migratory bird that visits the plateau during the spring and summer months, where they nest and raise their young. The windrunner's coloration is designed to repel harmful ultraviolet radiation, the Windrunner has also evolved its wing feathers down on its legs, giving it a tandem wing appearance which allows the bird to travel greater distances. The Windrunner is a migratory bird covering large distances to find food for their young, which they raise and care for on mountainous peaks. One of the primary reasons the Windrunners choose to raise their young on mountainous peaks is the absence of large predators, as few predators can survive out on isolated, lifeless plateau. The Windrunner only comes to the plateau during the warmer seasons where they can nest and care for their young in relative safety. Carnivorous, the Windrunner's diet is made up of silver spiders which they snatch from the spanning webs in the plateau's many canyons. While it may be possible the Windrunner itself is vulnerable to predation by the silver spider, it is unknown if the Windrunner faces predation itself, in the plateau or otherwise. Although the Great Blue Windrunner is generally regarded as being plausible, with most present-day crane species either being endangered or having declining populations, it is doubtful evolution could give rise to such a species. The silver spider is a controversial topic, due to the way it has manipulated the poggle. Realistically such fast-breeding rodents could easily outnumber and escape the spiders. Most viewers stated that the idea of mammals being on brink of extinction is implausible as mammals are highly adaptable even at huge losses. Arguments include that surviving mammals would most likely not get outcompeted by reptiles, fish, birds, and invertebrates in the way presented in the future as wild, which some fans even found insulting. Realistically fast breeding rodents such as the poggle may have easily outnumbered and escaped the silver spider, though it may be possible that the poggle repr. Oduces more slowly than other rodents. 